I'm going to present some information about wood composites. Before we start talking about wood composite engineered products, I'd like to say a few words about wood itself. This little cube here, uh, of, of environmentally friendly material, contains 5 million wood fibres, which are small hollow cells, about 30 microns across. Wood is an environmentally friendly and renewable material, so there are big incentives to use it. In fact, the global wood usage per person, per day, is about 100 cubes, like this one. If we look at the structure of wood, we can see in cross-section that it's made out of hollow cells represented on this little wooden cube. Uh, there are longitudinal cells, the maximum stiffness is in that direction, and indeed the cellulose, which is the stiff component of the wood cell wall, has an elastic modulus of about 138 gigapascals. Because it's a, a, a hollow structure, and these very stiff cellulose molecules are oriented around the cell wall in a spiral, uh, wood ends up with an elastic modulus of about 10 gigapascals, so a reduction of a factor of about 14. So, in making wood composites, we're trying to make the very best use of a structure which is already a composite material, and what we're aiming to do is to improve properties in all direction in engineered wood products. So, going a stage further, here's a wedge from a piece of Scots pine, and we're all familiar with the concept of annual rings. You can see that we have dark zones, which are the late wood, uh, and high density, and pale zones, which are the early wood of low density. So this is another level of composite structure. So in considering all these levels of structure, you can see that we've got what we call a hierarchical structure, right down from the wood cell wall up to the structure of the whole tree. So what's the incentive for making wood composite products? Well, here's a sample of plywood. And you can see on the edge section that it's made out of thin layers of veneer which are bonded together with a very small amount of adhesive. The idea here is that the grain runs in one, runs in one direction, in one layer, and in the next layer at 90 degrees. So in, in the 2D plane of the product, we spread the properties um, in all directions. So uh, a product like this is very suitable for making floors, walls, sections of roofs and so on, where the properties need to be pretty constant in all directions. And we have very, very consistent properties too, with much less variation due to the small defects that we find in wood like splits and knots and so on. Cheaper uh, wood-based products are materials such as oriented strand board. This is a laboratory made product. And here, instead of peeling uh, layers of wood in the form of veneer from tree trunks or slicing the wood, we produce chips in, in a chipper in the factory. And you can see these chips, quite large ones on the surface here. The idea of uh, producing a chip-based product is that we can use very small thinnings from forests in order to make up the total product. But it's very much like plywood in the sense that all the, all the chips are roughly oriented along the plane of the panel on each face and they run roughly at 90 degrees in the other direction. So overall we have a very useful product, very often used for uh, surrounding building sites. Uh, you might have a two meter tall fence around the outside made of this material and also for repairing shop windows which have been damaged in raids, another well-known use for them. Another product where the mechanical properties aren't so good is chipboard. And chipboard is made out of very small finer pieces which are easier to produce and less care is taken in orienting the particles in the structure. Tripboard does tend to have a denser uh, top and bottom layer uh, with lower density material inside, and it's pre pressed uh, in, a, in a continuous process in the factory. Another product which is well known is medium density fiberboard. So instead of using flakes or chips, in this case we're using wood fibers. And we might start off with a layer perhaps this thick. Um, where a small amount of resin is included and the material is gradually squashed down until it's uh, at the correct density and cured at an elevated temperature and we end up with a, a large product. Um, so this is medium density fibre board. So those products either have the same density uh, as the original tree that the fibres or chips or, or um, uh, particles came from 
Um, in this case, we have an insulation product, which is used in walls in order to increase the, the um, thermal properties of a house, for example. This particular one is tongue and grooved, it can be produced in large quantities. And the point here is that the, the fiber is deliberately kept at a lower density, so it's not pressed at a high pressure. Again, it's adhesively bonded, and we can vary the density of the product according to the end application. So wood fiber does find a lot of uses in insulation products such as this one. Uh, in the USA in particular, we have much larger, bulkier uh, uh, chip-based products. This one is called Intralam, made by Trust Joyce and Macmillan. And it's producing continuous sec sections, rather like um, extruding uh, a plastic, if you like, except here we're roughly aligning strips of wood and using a radio frequency heating system to cure the resin, which is very often the phenolic resin. Uh, this is a similar product called Paralam, and if you look at it, you can probably see on the end grain here we've got quite large chips with maybe um, fairly big gaps in between. But these are very strong products, and again, can be produced in continuous lengths in. Um, large timber buildings. Many of you will have seen uh, glue laminated timber, which is a product used in supermarket roofs, sports stadia, very often in swimming pools where humidity and slightly higher temperature can cause other products to corrode and fail in various ways. Reinforced concrete uh, above swimming pools in London failed in a big way in the 1970s. Now here we have a system where we join small pieces of timber end to end by using fingers and I think you can see them here um, in this little sample. And if I press the two, two uh, sides of the, of the sample together you can see we can produce a, an end to end joint which again is secured with a resin, could be an isocyanate or a phenolic and uh, pressure is applied and we can make very very large structures in, in continuous infinite lengths and, and also side bond these, these uh, bonded lengths of wood in order to produce really big beams, perhaps a metre by metre in some cases. And the only real limitation on the size of the beam is the problems associated with transporting the beam to site. So if you have an articulated truck, the length of the truck is really going to determine the maximum length of the product. Moving on from that, we have high beams, another very well-known wood composite product. Um, this particular one has got two flanges, top and bottom, and a shear wear in between. And clearly this would be part of a very long beam. Now the flanges at the top will take, um, under a bending load, uh, tensile stresses at the bottom, uh, compressive stresses at the top, and the flange will take shear loads. These are really effective structures for spanning large distances, and they're used a great deal in timber frame buildings, particularly in Scotland, where the erection of buildings when the weather is quite cold has to be done at considerable speed. It's a well known product, we can drill small holes in it, we can put services through it in the form of pipes and cables and so on. Now, the, the star material of the moment is cross laminated timber CLT. Uh, this is a BK structures product, and essentially what we have here is, if you like, a very, very thick version of plywood. So we have planks. So we see the end grain here and here, and the longitudinal grain here. It's basically cross-laminated planks from which we can produce really large panels of wood. Uh, we can cut doorways and window openings in advance, and we can transport these prefabricated elements to site. So in London at the moment, at Murray Grove, we have a, an eight-floor building, which is made out of cross-laminated timber. About 95% of the structure is made out of wood, including the lift shafts and it can be constructed very quickly, which local residents always prefer uh, compared with conventional steel and concrete buildings, which can take a very long time uh, to go up with a lot of intensive work on site. Wood products sometimes require reinforcement, or they can be re repaired if they've been catastrophically loaded to failure. So this is an example of laminated veneer lumber, which is like a thick plywood, and the grooves have been um, routed into the top and bottom, and we've used reinforced plastic in the form of protrusion, uh, unidirectional glass reinforced plastic, which are bonded into the grooves, the, the beam is, is pushed back into shape, uh, the protrusions are bonded into the slots uh, using a quick setting adhesive, and we can repair the structure. So this is very much a hybrid of um, uh, an engineered wood composite 
and reinforcement. Another example of this is uh, a sample which was designed to examine the fatigue performance of laminated wood wind turbine blades where we have reinforced plastics on the outside and you can see a thick plywood effectively uh, structure on the inside with little scarf joints holding layers together. And here we carried out fatigue tests and we modelled the, the weatherproof reinforced plastic finish in the, in the actual turbine blade product. If you want to find out more about wood composites, um, I edited this book which came out this year, 2015, um, published by Woodhead Elsevier, and it's going to be lodged in the IOM3 library if you want to consult it. So um, much of the information which I've given this afternoon, and indeed a huge amount more, is contained in the 16 chapters uh, in this book. So thank you for your attention.